Okay, so welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Lara Samhan, and inshallah, today we're going to be talking about the physiology of female reproductive system. So to start off, good afternoon, inshallah, ya Rab. Uh, happy national day to everyone. Inshallah, you guys enjoy your day and the long weekend. So let's start off. Okay, so basically in this lecture, we're going to more focus on the female reproductive system than the male reproductive system, even though we might have some uh, similarities between like both systems, but in general, like they are almost completely different. Okay, so starting off with the uh, learning objective of our lecture, we're going to focus, as we said, more into the female uh, reproductive system. So we're going to get uh, to know more about the sex determination of the female, about the hormones, about the puberty. As we know, puberty happens in both female and males. So like this is one of the most common things that actually happen in both genders. We're going to get to know more about the oogenesis, which happens in females not males and we're going to get to know more about the female reproductive system about the uh, anatomy of the female reproductive system the ovary fallopian tube uterus cervix and the vagina and lastly we're going to focus on the uh, external genitalia okay so starting off with the sex determination of the female as we know female is um, having two x's which is like 46 xx male has 46 xy now if a female has 46 xx that means uh, she will not have the SRY gene. And if this SRY gene is available in an individual, that means this individual will be a male because the SRY gene is only available in males, while in females, normally they should lack this gene to be like a normal uh, physiological uh, female with 46XX. Now, if this SRY gene is not available in females, that means this female is normal and she's going to have the normal internal and external genitalia. She'll have a normal uterus, fallopian tube, ovary, uh, cervix, and vagina. And in regards to the female, they'll have the malarian duct by, the, by having the absence of anti-malarian hormone. Now, how to remember that the females have this malarian duct? Is that just remember, malarian is like Mimi, so like Mimi is something cute, so it's something to females. Emma and regard to Wolfian duct is going to be available in males. Just remember Wolfian, like wolf, so wolf for males, so like, like uh, there's something like in relation to, like, to both of them together. Fa, like Wolfian is male, Malarian is female. So now in regard, as we said, we're going to focus more into females. So we're going to talk more about the Malarian duct, which is available in female during embryology. And this Malarian duct, um, uh, when it's available during embryology, it will all the way develop into the mature fallopian tube, uterus, and the outer or upper portion of the vagina. And then after that, uh, one of the most important hormones in the female, and it actually uh, um, like really contributes a lot into the female uh, reproductive system in regards to anatomy is the estrogen. So estrogen actually helps in the development of the external female genitalia, which are the lower vagina, clitoris, labia minora, and labia majora. And this uh, figure on the right side, actually it just uh, this, uh, like uh, explains more about the SRY. As we said, if SRY gene is available, that means it's gonna be more in regard to the uh, to the male, which is like the testis development and everything in regards to the male. As we said, Wolfian duct, wolf, Wolfian male, but it's going to be available in the male during embryology, and then it will develop into the uh, male uh, genitalia, which is the vas deferens, epididymis, and the seminal vesicles. In regard to females, usually they should lack or they shouldn't have this SRY gene to be a normal female with XX, double X, which is 46XX, compared to males, which will have X and Y. Now, uh, we're gonna have a, a lack of this gene and having the lack of this gene is gonna actually result in a normal um, a female genitalia by having, for example, the ovary, the, uh, the, the ovary, and we have, as we said, the estrogen or the estradiol is gonna develop the external female genitalia, like the labia minora, majora, and the lower vagina. Okay, so uh, something to add as well in regard to the dihydrotestosterone, this uh, hormone actually helps in the development of the male external genitalia, for example, like the penis, the penal urethra, and the scrotum. If the male have lack of this uh, of this hormone, that means you know, they will have the internal uh, male genitalia, but the external male genitalia will be undeveloped or will actually not be available. Okay. Okay, now moving on, as we said, uh, to the female genitalia, we're gonna focus more into the female. So we have on the right side of hand, this very big picture, which demonstrates this on the right hand, the female uh, internal uh, genitalia, 
This is during embryology and on this left side, the external genitalia. Now, basically, uh, in regard to this, let's start off with this picture. This picture uh, shows off the embryology of the female, like how it actually looks during embryology of the female reproductive system. Now, as we said, for the female, they will have Mullerian duct, like Mullerian, Mimi, something cute, so it's going to be in regard to female. So they have this Mullerian duct, which will then develop to the female uh, internal um, uh, organs, like the ovary, uterus, and everything else. And then we have over here, like this is the uh, Mullerian duct, and then this Mullerian duct, as we said, will develop into the female organs. So basically, it just shows during embryology life how this Mullerian duct will be this, uh, will uh, actually form um, the internal genitalia, for example, like the ovary, the uterus, and everything else. So over here, it just shows this is the Mullerian duct, as we can see in here, and this is just a mini bud, which will then form a uterus, which is like a uterus big structure. And as we can see in here, uh, at uh, this happens at 10 weeks of um, gestational age. And then at birth, we uh, like a female or a baby girl should be born with a normal uh, female uh, uh, internal and external genitalia by having the, uh, the uterus, as we can see in here, the fallopian tube, the ovaries, and the vagina, the, the vagina and the cervix. Uh, if any if any abnormal thing happened, for example, in regard to hormones, if the female had only one X or any other thing in general, any abnormalities will result in abnormal formation of the whole uh, female reproductive system. This is in regards to the embryology and the development of the um, uh, female reproductive system from inside, like how it looks from inside. Now moving on to how it looks from outside. This patient is basically in a lithotomy position, or in other words, like both legs are wide, so uh, and the patient is sleeping so fine. Uh, so basically, uh, as we can see in here, we have this thing is the uh, this outer thing all the way outside is the mons pubis, and this thing at the beginning is the clitoris. We have over here the outside holding is the labia majora, like majora is big. This thing in here is the labia minora. We have over here the two openings, as we can see in this picture, the uh, urethral opening and the vaginal opening. And at the end, we can see in here is the anus. Okay, so yeah, so basically this is it. Now we have over here uh, something, this is a fancy name of Mayer Rokintasi, which actually, in other words, is um, MRKH. And this is basically a syndrome, which is, um, uh, for example, if females presented with primary amenorrhea, They'll be, actually, they'll be actually having this syndrome and it's basically something abnormal because of the uh, fail of the malaria duct to be basically merging. Okay, so we have embryology again. So basically uh, on the left side, it's talking about embryology and the right side is all just uh, explaining what exactly happens. So let's start off with the embryology. It just explains how basically the female um, the reproductive system, uh, for example, forms. We have in here in the weeks 7 to 12, 11 to 12, and 20 to 25. So basically just say in here uh, how meiosis is going to happen, the ovarian uh, organogenesis, how it's going to actually develop, and the uh, formation of the primordial follicle. And as we know, this primordial follicle uh, will actually keep on developing by a couple of stages, as we already took in first year. And then at the end, uh, it's going to um, uh, either, for example, uh, have a menstrual cycle, like during puberty, or it will be fertilized. Uh, here we have an regard in uh, during 11 to uh, 12 weeks. It just says that the oviduct, the uterus cervix, and the external uh, genitalia will all the way be developing during this two weeks. And then at the end, it will say over here, the primary uh, follicle in the ovary is going to be like um, fully mature during 20 to 25 weeks. This is basically embryology, just for reading. Now, uh, let's come off to, the, uh, to this figure. As we know, female is XX. So normally, they will have complete chromosomes, 23 plus 23, which is 46. So 46 XX. Normally, as we said, they will not have the SLY gene, so that they will be a normal uh, female with normal reproductive system. Uh, the ovary will be going, uh, the follicles of the ovary will be going into the oogenesis to be forming the primary oocyte and the, until it forms till at the end the uh, mature follicle. As is over here, the Mullerian duct will form the, uh, the internal genitalia of the females. And uh, the ex if we have no uh, DHT, which is the dihydrotestosterone, that means the uh, female will be having a normal external genitalia, like the uh, external genitalia starts off from the outer vagina onwards. So we have the uh, uh, outer vagina, labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, and the bulbs, or we can see the glands. So yeah. 
And as we said over here, females usually don't have uh, testosterone. Yani they will have regression of the wolfian duct. As we said, wolfian, yani wolf. So wolf is only for males. So basically in this picture, it just explains more about the um, granulosa cell and the uh, theca interna and externa. So we have in here, this picture is basically the follicle where we can see here the theca externa. If we have external, that means we have interna. So this green thing is the theca interna. And then we have over here, this um, orange thing is basically the granulosa. So yes, yeah, so basically this shows the follicle uh, development, which is inside the ovary. Okay, moving on. So basically, what are the changes that happen during puberty? As in the puberty it happens during most, uh, most of the time, it happens during a teen age. Uh, for both females and males, and usually in regular females, they have puberty earlier than males, and that's uh, due to the you know, hormonal changes and everything. So, um, and usually, for example, if a female is fat, if she if she's obese or if she's slim, if she's playing, for example, um, if she's an athlete, if she's playing exercise and everything, basically every single thing the female does definitely affect her hormones, affect her puberty, and. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, for example, if a female is athlete, that means she might have, after, like, during having puberty and after puberty, she might have menstrual changes, and uh, this really shows how much, um, like, external environment and uh, the um, daily diet and activity the female does really affect her hormones, uh, compared to males, which actually aren't as much affected in regard to external stimulus or in regard to the environmental changes, diet changes, compared to females. So basically, during puberty, uh, if, uh, for example, if a female is quite obese, she would have high of the leptin, and leptin is basically, um, uh, you're just going to tell, for example, the it's uh, like in regard to SPI axis, the high, the hypothalamus pituitary uh, axis, and for example, it tells in the halas, uh, no need to eat more, halas, the satiety is good. This is like the function of the leptin, and it's usually produced from the uh, adipose tissue. Now, uh, for example, the first menstrual cycle that the female has during puberty, is basically called as the menarche, and this is like the first onset of the menses, or, or in other words, the bleeding. Um, so basically, during puberty, what increases is the the estrogen uh, hits like high sky, and it increases a lot. This increase of estrogen isn't gonna only lead to the menses, or in other words, bleeding, but it also leads to the darkening of the areola, which is in the breast. Uh, the color of it is gonna darken. Number one, number two, we're gonna have Hair that's going to develop both in the genitalia and also under the arms. And uh, so basically, yeah, this is it. And basically, in regard to the mammary gland, when the mammary gland gets enlarged during puberty, it's called as the lethargy. Uh, a thalarchy, I meant. Okay, so basically, not only the estrogen is uh, high during puberty, but also the progesterone is high. And it helps in the development of the memory, memory glands. And now the estrogen, the progesterone is going to help more during pregnancy because it's going to help the uterus and um, all the uh, female uh, uh, reproductive system to be actually accommodating and to be secreting and functioning as if there is uh, there is a um, fetus who's going to be all the way embedded in the uterus. So both estrogen and progesterone plays a very important role during puberty, and progesterone really plays a very, like more important role during pregnancy. Okay, okay. So let's come off with the tenor stages. So basically, like um, as we have lots of stages in different things. For example, stage one, two, three, four. They said, "Why well, want to make a tenor stages?" And it's just gonna tell us the development of the breast, the um, development of the hair in both females and males during puberty. So basically, this type of stage explains, explains in different stages what exactly happens, starting off uh, from stage one onwards, and uh, what are the developments that will happen all the way to females and males during puberty. So tenor stage can be used for both genders, females and also males. So it basically explains in here, for example, the, the height, the menarche, everything. And usually females are compared to males like shorter. It's because of hormonal um, uh, changes. So basically, if you had any question, just anywhere, for example, either written or, or exam, the answer is just, uh, it's always going to be like hormonal changes, especially in females, like they are very much affected to hormones uh, compared to males. So yeah, so hormones really play a very major and important uh, role. Okay, so basically, as we said, the tenor stage explains the uh, the female and male 
uh, reproductive changes, especially in regard to breast and hair distribution. Uh, okay, so moving on. Okay, so basically I have an interesting case which I really would like to share. It's basically a case of a teenager, a male, a female, basically it started off with being a female. So a baby girl is born as being a baby girl. And then she was raised till puberty as till day, uh, like as being a girl. Now, once puberty came, she had delay in her menses and she had no breast development and her voice begins to become like more toughened. So basically the parents came to ask, came to ask the endocrinology doctor based on lots of investigations. It was at, at the end discovered that this patient has a karyotype of XY. That means this baby is, this teenager actually is raised as female for, from being born till puberty is raised as a female. Now we discovered that this uh, female is actually a male with a karyotype of XY. And basically this uh, thing happened because during a uh, neonatological examination, once the baby was born, the doctor missed out the um, uh, the vagina pouch actually was closed. So the, so the doctor that was um, examining this patient didn't actually discover that the vagina pouch was closed. That means that this male, which is XY, is actually born as a male, but he, uh, he had uh, internal male genitalia, he had internal testis, which was actually in the abdomen and uh, didn't descend yet. And uh, because of that, this male presented as a female external genitalia that wasn't discovered except being puberty. Hashan, there was no uh, good uh, ex neonatal examination that was done when this male baby was born. So unfortunately, this, this uh, male actually changed his whole lifestyle, like everything from name, from clothes, from school, like everything you actually name it, um, as being a male during puberty. And um, he had the development during puberty of external male genitalia. And uh, the, uh, his voice is actually rough. There is no any breast development. Uh, like basically everything is, is, is turning off to male because of that during puberty, it's a very important period where actually like other than hormonal changes happen in normal individuals, but actually lots of parents discover that some of males are actually female and vice versa. So because of that, because of that, it's really very important to discover everything early on and to do really a thorough examination uh, during in a, a, neonatology, a neonatology, neonatology examination. So I thought this is an interesting case to share. Okay, moving on to our Turner stages. So as I said, it happened in both females and males. So starting off with the Turner stage of a male, or of a female, we're going to talk of the hair distribution at the beginning. So in regard to the female um, hair distribution, it starts off with a triangular shape, starting off from below all the way it descends to the all the way it ascends to the up. This is the hair development in the female compared to a male um, uh, development, which actually starts off with the at the base. So basically, it's, it grows all the way till like uh, till it's like fully distributed at the base, tamam. This is in regard to the male, this is in regard to the female. We have different stages, stage one, two, three, four, and five. In regard to the, and as we can see over here, the ages are approximate ages. So uh, yeah, so now in regard to the breast development in females, it starts off with being flat and then it uh, keeps on budding. The areola becomes darker in pigmentation. For example, it becomes more brown in color till the areola also be like uh, ascends all the way up from being down in here till it ascends up until the final stage, a normal developed um, female breast. Uh, so basically, a female can develop, uh, for example, can be in the hair development, so on in the genitalia or even under the arm. For example, can be in stage two, while the breast development can be in stage three. So it's not necessary to have the genitalia hair development and breast development at the same stage. They can actually happen in different stages. Tamam. For example, breast development can be stage four, hair can be stage three, well, a stage two, well, a stage five. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really uh, exactly happen at the exact same stages. But this stage is, is, is done actually just to clarify how the development, for example, of the hair, the breast happens. Uh, yeah, so basically this development happens when during menarche. And as I said, menarche is basically the menses, which is the bleeding uh, or the menstrual bleeding. So where we have the uh, genitalia or pubic hair and axillary hair, as, uh, axillary hair as well. Okay, so moving on. I just want to know, guys, if you have any questions. Any questions so far? If you have any questions, just kindly write it in the um in the chat box.
Okay. Okay, no questions. Okay, alhamdulillah. Perfect. Tamam. Okay, moving on. Now let's talk more about the oogenesis. Oogenesis, genesis. is mean that, like, um, how it happens. So oogenesis, how the oogenesis happens. As we saw this picture before during first year, uh, basically just, uh, this is just a quick review of uh, how the oogenesis happens. We basically have mitosis, we have meiosis. For meiosis, we have meiosis one, we have meiosis two. So just a quick review, as we said, the female is gonna have 46 XX. So as we can see in here, basically uh, the meiotic uh, stages, as we know, meiosis is the division. For example, one is going to become two, two is going to become four onwards. In regard to um, meiosis, this just shows how the primary follicle, for example, we have over here, this picture and this picture are the same, but here it just shows the um, how what happens exactly from the inside. So here we have the primary follicle, the secondary follicle, the gradient follicle, how the, uh, the graphene follicle, how it actually looks like. And then we have over here the corpus luteum, for example, if uh, it can actually degenerate. And uh, if pregnancy, for example, if fertilization happens and pregnancy is gonna happen, it's gonna, it's not, it's it will not generate, it will stay. Why? Because it, it's actually one of the things that help in the uh, production of the progesterone hormone. So yeah, during pregnancy, it's gonna stay. Other than that, during um, every month menstrual cycle, it will degenerate. Okay, so basically in here, it just says that uh, usually once the female is born, uh, her follicle or her, or her uh, graphene follicle will stop in meiosis one. And um, uh, meiosis two is gonna actually be completed once fertilization happens. So yes, okay, perfect. And yeah, okay, okay. Perfect. Okay, so moving on to the uh, talking more about the female reproductive system. As we said in here, the uh, function of the female reproductive system is basically to, to produce ova, and this ova is going to either get fertilized, pregnancy, or it's going to degenerate and have the menstrual cycle. And then in here, the HPG axis, so the hypothalamic pituitary axis, is going to actually significantly help on this thing in the production of hormones, uh, estrogen and progesterone to regulate everything. If, for example, we have high levels of estrogen and progesterone, we'll have a negative feedback to decrease them and vice versa. So basically, in regard to the ovarian cycle here, it's simulated for the growth and development of the ovulation. And um, we have over here, as we said, we have the uterus. It has the endometrial lining. Uh, this endometrium is basically um, uh, responsible once the menstrual cycle is going to happen, all the, endometrius, all, the, all the endometrium is going to shed and cause bleeding, which is the menstrual cycle. Oh, if fertilization happens, this endometrium will thicken and it will thicken by the help of the progesterone, which is going to thicken the um, endometrium uh, to help in the um, embedding of the uh, fetus. And what else? Okay, good. Okay, so in here we can see a uh, section of a, a sagittal section of the female uh, genitalia and uh, rectum and anus colon as well as well as the bladder. So basically, in this section, as we can see, this is um, this starting off with this thing. This is basically the bladder. Basically, this is the anterior side, and this is the posterior side. Now, from the anterior side, moving on, this is the pubic symphysis. This is the mons pubis. Moving backward, we have in here, this is the bladder, this is the urethra, oh, so we're done with this. Be, uh, behind the bladder and in front of the colon or in front of the rectum, we have the uterus, or in other words, we have the female um, uh, reproductive organs. So basically, this is the uterus. This lining in here, this reddish lining is the endometrium. And we have this thing is the fallopian tube. This thing is the frimbri. This whitish thing is the ovary. We have in here, this is the cervix, this one is the cervix, this one is the cervix, this long thing is the vagina, and then this is the, over here we have the labia majora and the labia minora, and behind the uh, uterus, we have the colon. Now let's focus more into this thing. Basically, uh, just an extra um, information. For example, if they want to take a vaginal swab, uh, where do you guys think? Do they usually take it from the anterior fornix? Or from the posterior fornix? What do you guys think? Just by guessing? Posterior, exactly you're right, yeah. So basically take it from the posterior, why? Because posterior compared to the anterior is deeper, like 
for example, anterior stops here, they can posterior moves all the way backwards, so it's deeper. And since it's deeper, uh, this is where more, uh, for example, bacteria, fungi, uh, or, or for example, any like abnormality gathers in here. So taking a sample in here, it's, it gives actually us the results way more precise than the anterior fornix. Okay, perfect. Okay, moving on. If we're gonna just repeat everything, as we know, this is the uterus, this is the fallopian tube, ovary, this is the cervix and the vagina. Uh, as you know, we have over here the labia majora, labia minora, vaginal opening at the end. So this is the female uh, reproductive uh, system. And we have the, as we said, the internal and the external female reproductive system. So, uh, okay, perfect. So this actually shows us like a cross section of the ovary with how the follicle actually matures. And then at the end, uh, amongst all the follicles that will get matured, only one follicle will actually be all the way uh, sent out of the uh, ovary. And as we said, the corpus uh, luteum is going to either stay or degenerate. If pregnancy happens, it's going to stay. If menstrual cycle happens, it will all the way degenerate. Okay, so in regard to the ovary, uh, to get more to know about the anatomy, we have the cortex of the, this is the ovary, the whole structure of the ovary. Outside is the cortex of the ovary. Inside is the medulla. And this place where we have blood vessels is known as the helium. And it contains blood vessels, either um, arteries or veins, and lymphatics as well. Okay, perfect. Okay, now moving into the endocrine, as we said, Everything is about hormones. Like if you said uh, hormones is an answer for everything, and most of the times it's actually correct. So uh, estrogen and progesterone, as we said, plays a very important role in the um, uh, female secondary sexual development, and uh, it helps in the uh, menstrual cycle. Uh, it helps in, uh, for example, if if, if uh, fertilization happens, progesterone significantly helps in uh, getting the uterus all the way accommodated. Uh, there is going to be a fetus. Um, okay, perfect. So basically, we have in regard to the development of the follicle and the sex steroid, they have critical roles. So, uh, for example, the oocyte at ovulation, the uh, release of the oocyte at ovulation, the production of nutrients. Uh, it's prepared basically the vagina and the fallopian tube that fertilization is going to happen. Uh, it also prepared the lining of the uterus for implantation. So basically, everything is going to be like get accommodated based on what will happen. Okay, perfect. Now, in regard to the oviduct, this oviduct, this is the oviduct, which is basically divided into uh, parts. We have over here the intramural, intramural, we have the isthmus, the ampulla, and the fimbri. What is the most common site of fertilization to happen in the fallopian tube or in the oviduct? Yeah. Perfect, exactly. Most of the fertilization, like almost normal fertilization should happen in the ampulla. Okay, so basically you have a question in here. If fertilization didn't happen, estrogen is going to take over? Yeah, no fertilization, so progesterone level will not hit sky high. And then estrogen and progesterone can, like, um, both of them, for example, uh, help each other to be having a menstrual cycle. That can, the progesterone is going to significantly increase, uh, decrease, as long as there is no pregnancy. A way to remember it, just remember that progesterone starts with letter P. Pregnancy starts with letter B, so P and B. So just remember, progesterone is going to be really so high during pregnancy, okay? Okay, so as you guys kindly said, mashallah alaikum, the ampulla is the most common site where fertilization is going to happen. And sometimes, actually, uh, fertilization happens in wrong places. For example, either in the abdomen, either in the uterus, either in the cervix, either in the vagina. And this is known as the ectopic pregnancy. Um... Even if the pregnancy, for example, happens anywhere uh, other than the ampulla, in the um, sometimes even the uh, like the um, fertilization happens and then it gets embedded into the fallopian tube. Well, anywhere else, this is the one as soon as the ectopic pregnancy, and uh, females are gonna present with abdominal pain. They might think that this pain is actually because of the like premenstrual cycle or menstrual cycle is gonna happen. That can um, after ultrasound is done. And it's better to be discovered early on, Ashan, not to have this uh, fertilized uh, ovum and um, sperm to be burst. Ashan, if it bursts, like uh, this case is going to get more complicated. And actually, it, it might, in uh, like late presentation, cause the death of the female. So it's better to be discovered early. And simply, uh, we can actually simply just check the um, by ultrasound. And also, we can check by the HCG level. If it's high, that means there is pregnancy. Okay, perfect. And this is an active pregnancy. There is no way that this active pregnancy can live. 
most of the times or almost all times, it's just gonna basically they can do an operation. Oh, maybe sometimes with the operation and then just remove this ectopic pregnancy and then follows. Oh, okay, good. So this is just extra knowledge. Okay, now let's have a, a very easy question. So where, as you guys said, where do fertilization happens? We said it mostly happens in the ampulla. So where is the ampulla? Exactly. It's basically in the fallopian tube. This is a normal pregnancy. Anything else is known as the ectopic pregnancy. If it gets embedded in any place uh, other than the uterus or the uh, endometrium. Okay, moving into the function of the oviduct or the fallopian cube. Basically, this oviduct um, is a site where fertilization happens. To be more specific, it most, most of the times it happens in the ampulla. Now, this sperm, as we know, it's going to all the way travel from the male um, uh, sexual organs all the way to the female, and it's going to undergo a couple of processes or a couple of um, uh, things for it to be all the way uh, embedding or entering into the uh, ovary and at least not dying. So we have a couple of things, one of which is the capacitation, it's going to have hyperactivity, it's going to need trigger for it to be having the power and all the way uh, be uh, moving against the, um, for example, against the uh, female, because female um, uh, organs are going to secrete things that, are, that will make uh, some sperms die. So basically the, the strongest sperm is going to reach to the ovary, to the uh, ovum, and fertilization is going to happen. Uh, now we have something known as the primary ciliary dyskinesia from its word primary. Ciliary. Ciliary is talking about the cilia. This kinesia, kinesia is kinetic, is movement. This is like there is something wrong. So once we have this cilia, usually cilia is available in the respiratory tract, in the reproductive tract, and then like many other things, for example, in the GI as well. So if this cilia happens, for example, is not working in one place, for example, let's say the reproductive organ, or the GI system, or the respiratory, that means most, most of the times it's actually uh, having like in the whole body, not only in one part, this uh, ciliary dyskinesia can happen. So if this thing happens, it will actually uh, make it as a burden for the ovary, uh, for the ovum and the sperm to be meeting and fertilization to happen. So this can be one of the things that can actually delay uh, pregnancy to be happening. Uh, if it was, for example, in the um, uh, in the female uh, reproductive system, if it actually also happened, like as an extra knowledge, if it happened in the respiratory tract or in the GI tract, this will also aid in the movement, for example, of the mucus or of the food all the way. So yeah, okay, perfect. Does it lead to amenorrhea? It actually can lead if the ovum can be uh, can move all the way to the fallopian tube. That means no can uh, for um, uh, this is going to happen. So yeah, it can actually lead. Yeah, it can lead. And uh, inshallah, yeah, there is actually a treatment for this uh, primary salary this kind of thing. Okay, perfect. So moving on. So in regard to the uh, uterus structure and function, as we know, uterus is uh, have a very significant role in the female reproductive system. It uh, uh, actually in the uterus we have the endometrium, which actually have the um, every month normally there's a menstrual cycle. If fertilization happens, that means and we're gonna have pregnancy. Uh, the um, the fertilized ovum and uh, the fertilized ovum is gonna all the way embed into the endometrium, and pregnancy is gonna happen. So yeah, so this is like one of the most important functions of the uterus. Uh, it helps in the implantation, as we said, of the fertilized egg or of the blastocyst. And if this implantation happens, the endometrium is going to get thickened to accommodate that there is a fetus. Hopefully, it is going to be all the way growing into this mini uh, womb. Um, okay, so yes. Okay, so that's everything. Moving on. And basically, uh, the um, the endometrium also gets accommodated that we're, we're going to also have the placenta, not only the fetus, we're going to also have the placenta uh, along with the fetus in the uterus. Okay, so moving on into the cervix. Uh, so this cervix is quite important and where is it available? It's available in the inferior part of the uterus and after the cervix we have the uh, vagina. So uh, sometimes we have the cervical swab is also done. So we basically we have the vaginal swab. As we said, it's mostly done and it's way better to be done from the posterior fornix of the vagina because it's deeper and it's way it's uh, it's where more of the um, uh, organisms actually are there. Lenodina organisms just remember that be, uh, like um, are in love to be in places where are deep and dark. So yeah, so this is in regard to the vaginal swab. We have also the cervical swab, and it's better to be done as to prevent or or it's it's basically like a um a screening for early cervical cancer in the squamous colonal junction. <clears throat> so they are really currently they are really working so hard 
to having the uh, cervical swab to be done in like almost all females after the age of like 21 onwards. Uh, so basically we have over here, I'm talking about the menstrual cycle, the sperm, as you can see in this picture, it basically uh, shows the uh, sperm that uh, are available in the female uh, reproductive organ. And we have over here two stages. We have the follicular stage and the luteal stage. And these stages just explain, um, uh, for example, how the uterus or how the endometrium is going to actually all the way get thickened. And then, for example, um, uh, how for if fertilization is going to happen, all the endometrium is going to all the way get shed. If there's no fertilization happening, the endometrium is going to all the way get thickened more and more. So, uh, yeah, this is by the help. Uh, of the uh, hormones, progesterone and estrogen, and they are described in being the in the uh, follicular stage and the uh, luteal stage. So follicular stage is responsible more into the estrogen hormone compared to the luteal phase, which is more into the progesterone. And as we said, during pregnancy, progesterone like PP, pregnancy, progesterone is going to be very high and the endometrium will be thickened more than the uh, normal endometrium, which gets all the way shunned. Uh, we have the transformation of the in the cervix of this uh, spinal colonial junction, as we said. Sometimes it turns to the cerv a cancer in the cervix because of the cervical dysplasia, and um, it um, it turns all the way to being malignant. But on there we can uh, during that case there's chemotherapy. There are a lot of treatments in regard to this thing. But uh, as I said, because of that, they always prefer early screening uh, to prevent like this stage from or a late stage from uh, cervical cancer happening. Okay, perfect. So we have a question. Okay, so basically normally the uh, female genitalia organs are acidic, more than being alkaline, and they are acidic to prevent any organisms from happening because as you know, like a vagina is an opening. So basically if it isn't acidic, or in other words, if it's alkaline, how neutral that means organisms are going to all the way easily reach into the Vagina, cervix, uterus. And if it's acidic, then you know acid is going to kill. Like acid is because it's acid, acid with low pH, it's going to kill organisms. It's going to try as much as possible to get, kill organisms, uh, to kill any abnormal uh, species, for example, living in the, uh, that might live all the way in the vagina, uh, in the uterus. So as we know, in our like an external environment, we have lots of bacteria, viruses, fungi, yeast, everything. So this, uh, having this uh, acidic environment into the vagina, and in general into the female reproductive system is going to prevent abnormal organisms to be all the way living. In case Allah, this acidity decreases, this will definitely predispose the female to be having more of the infections, more of the abnormal organisms living. So is it clear? Okay, perfect. Then moving on into the vagina. Now this vagina is basically, uh, it's going to extend all the way from the uterus or the cervix all the way to the outside. And it's basically an opening, which is between the anus and the urethra. So this opening is way bigger than the uh, urethra opening. And that actually helps in the uh, childbirth, like normal childbirth. And uh, basically uh, also dilates besides the cervix. Uh, so basically there are glands, as we know, um, like this place is a dark, dark uh, place. So uh, any dark place, as I said, any dark deep place is in favor for the organisms to be all the way living. Uh, so because of that, we have the glands that lubricate, for example, like we have some the gland. So basically, يعني, as we say, so basically in the mouth, if we have no salivary glands, that means our mouth is going to be dry. Same all the way goes to any part of the body. For example, we have sweat glands in our hands uh, and everything. So basically, in regard to the vagina, we also have glands that help to lubricate the area in general. Same also, uh, same all the way goes to the vagina. Beside the vagina, we have something called as the Bartholin gland. Now I'm gonna also share with you a case. So basically, um, for example, if there's any abnormality that happens or any injury that happens to this uh, Bartholin gland, for example, like laser or anything, uh, this actually causes the Bartholin gland to um, to swell and it becomes a cyst, which is something abnormal. So like this is one of the things that actually happens to female if uh, they've done uh, laser. And uh, the birthing band is all the way available beside the vagina. So yeah, so this is just actually a case that um, that actually happens. And uh, yeah, okay, so I, I thought it's worth sharing it. So basically in regard to the vagina, it's inverted by the pudendal nerve. And as we know, the pudendal nerve is basically um, most of the, um, 
organs or structures in the uh, external genitalia are all the way supplied by the pudendal nerve. And uh, it also contributes, uh, yeah, helps in the sexual intercourse. And okay, so basically, as we know, glycogen or sugar in general helps in everything. So one, it helps the sperm to be all the way reaching to the uh, ovum for fertilization. And um, okay, so I guess that's it in this slide. Okay. Moving on to the female external genitalia, as we can see in here, and as we said from before, this is the most pubis. We have in here the labia majora, labia minora. We have over here the urethral opening, and this is the vaginal opening. As we said, the vaginal opening is way bigger than the urethral opening. Ajan, because of that, this is one of the like things that should really be acidic, Ajan, to prevent organisms from all the way entering inside. We also have this as the anus, so the, the vagina, is between the uh, urethra and the anus. Tamam. So, uh, okay, so in regard to the part of the uh, gland, it's basically beside the vagina, somewhere in here, somewhere in here. So if anything abnormal happens, it will all the way swell and form as a cyst. So perfect. Okay, so, and we have glands all the way around uh, the area, and this gland is just to keep it moist, uh, clean, uh, and also these glands actually help in um, preventing uh, like bacteria from accumulating in this area. So because of that, glands are really very important, similar to like salivary or any other gland in the body. And this very beginning opening is known as the clitoris, tamam? And this clitoris have also glands around it. Okay, perfect. I tamam, during sexual arousal, the clitoris is gonna all the way um, uh, enlarge a little bit. And uh, this all is like in the, uh, in the sexual intercourse, like all this, all of this thing happened during the sexual intercourse. Tamam. So talking more about the um, uh, female organs and the uh, sexual intercourse and the uh, like what happened exactly in the sexual intercourse. Basically, you have uh, four main phases, which is the excitement, the plateau, the <coughs> excuse me, excitement, plateau, the orgasm and the resolution. These things happen all the way during the sexual intercourse, generally speaking to female and male. But as I said in uh, this uh, lecture, we focus more on to the, uh, to the female. So basically, uh, this everything happens in here is very normal. It's not uh, psychological, but it's physiological. Uh, so uh, we have excitement that's going to all the way happen, physical and psychological excitement. The pudendal nerve, as we said, uh, is going to play a role as long as the sacral plexus and uh, during the sexual intercourse the parasympathetic is going to play a role as well as the sympathetic sympathetic is going to actually increase the heart rate increase the blood pressure increase the respiratory rate increase the muscle tension all the way compared to the parasympathetic which is going to relax uh, most of the um, female uh, uh, sexual organs also the parasympathetic plays a role in the male which is going to facilitate the blood vessels and um, yeah, so basically it's like plays a role in both females and males. And um, during basically during the, uh, this happens, so basically we talked about the excitement, we talked about the plateau phase, and it goes all the way to the uh, orgasm phase. We have over here the sympathetic uh, simulation is gonna be sky high, and we're gonna have the pelvic musculature is like a contraction of the um, pelvic musculature, for example, contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. And uh, this is gonna happen all the way starting off, mostly with the uh, lower third of the vagina. Uh, okay, so in regard to the resolution, yeah, and you almost once the sexual intercourse is almost about to be done, the resolution or uh, is gonna be happening, or in other words, the relaxation phase, especially mostly it affects, uh, this phase mostly affects the uh, uh, males more than the female, like in regard to relaxation. So these are the four stages of the um, female sexual cycle during the sexual intercourse. And by this, I'm done with my lecture. I hope you guys understood, and I hope I just made things clearer. So if you, if you please have any questions, just please type in the chat box. You're most welcome. Any other questions? Perfect, you're most welcome. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I guess no questions. If you guys have any question in this lecture or in any other lecture in general, my contact number is available in the first slide. So you can contact me, feel free to contact me or have to meet me if you would like face, face to face or Zoom anytime you would like. And it's definitely my pleasure to be always helping you guys. Oh, I'm proud of you. Inshallah, best of luck.
Thank you. Awesome.